of dear friends welcome to the 14th lecture of the aligarh society of history and archaeology asha and ganga jamni joint venture to present a scientific and secular past today's lecture is part of the series reflections of our shared past it would revolve around a very important topic our shared linguistic history the topic as announced is before the hindi urdu divide day before yesterday uh, professor najaf hader spoke about a text written in a language defined by many as braj bhasha also entitled or identified as hindavi najaf also opined that do khusro is one of the first to talk of hindavi but he seldom wrote in it do many hindavi verses of khusro are floating all around us dr sunil sharma too doubts the veracity of these verses being attributed to amir khusro today the well known scholar of hindi dr francesca orsani would further open up the layers for us dr orsani is professor of hindi and south asian literature at soas university of london a fellow of the british academy and the author of the hindi public sphere 1920 1940 language and literature in the age of nationalism published in 2000 two another book offers is print and pleasure popular literature and entertaining fictions in colonial north india published in 2009 she has just finished a book on the multilingual literary history of avadh north india from the 15th century to the early 20th century and is leading and horizon 2020 erc research project on multilingual locals and uh, significant geographies for a new approach to world literature from the perspective of three regions north india the maghreb and the horn of africa her authorship is not confined to these books only one of her books is in hindi hindi Kalok with uh, published in 2011 two of her most popular and well accepted edited works are before the divide hindi and urdu literary culture published in 2011 based on a workshop on intermediary genres in hindi and urdu and the second one is tellings and texts music literature and performance in north india which she did with Catherine Scofield in 2015 Dr Orsani also edits the journal Love in South Asia I was fortunate enough to have been at SWAS in May 2007 when she organized a grand seminar after Temur left which ultimately formed the basis of her 2014 publication along with samira sheikh who is also scheduled to deliver a lecture to us later on after temur left culture and circulation in 15th century north india is the result of this particular seminar this seminar was a very well attended one in which scholars like late simon digby and late alison bush amongst a host of others had taken part I was also fortunate to be a part of the weekly seminars which Dr Orsini used to organize those days. In fact, I too got a chance to speak in one of them. Dr Francesca Orsini is a constant visitor to India. She visited us at Aligarh way back I don't remember uh, whether it was 2008 or 9 and also delivered a lecture at the department of history which was chaired by professor ilfan habib today she will be speaking to us 
on the topic before the hindi urdu divide over to you dr orsen dr francesca orsen please thank you very much professor rezavi and uh, um thank you to shagufta for uh, organizing this i will now share my screen um and start right right so um in fact i have been to aliga and to the library several times i think last time i don't think 2014 for sure but even afterwards to your wonderful wonderful library the center for persian studies you know it's the one of my favorite places um today i'm going to come back to the um, uh, topic of uh, the hindi urdu divide from two perspectives one is the kind of general um way you know public discourse around language uh, how we how we talk about languages and languages identities and the other is about is from my own disciplinary um, field which is literary history i'm i'm always struck uh, how um when we talk about languages or language identities we are immediately placed into language camps huh? you are um which are exclusive huh? exclusionary so you you can either be a hindi wali or an angrezi wali or an urdu wali i remember uh, watching this uh, debate uh, years ago or uh, when um, the question of uh, the compulsory english exam for upsc exams um, was raised um on we the people and willy nilly uh, the the host barkadat immediately placed whatever people were actually saying i remember professor alok rai ashok bachpay were actually making points that were you know um across languages but they were imagine immediately placed into uh the hindi camp and and uh, despite the fact in fact that most if not all of us have more than one language uh, as part of our makeup so, and so of course um being put into language camps is in fact a result of what i'm going to talk about today this sort of hindi urdu divide it has to do with a sort of community identity around language with nationalism but how accurate historically and how beneficial it is uh, when um, the reality and the individual and social level is much more complicated than that so i mean i think just very briefly to go back to the history of this divide of course there are some many um, really you know, important uh, works that have shown how um the divide sort of uh, grew uh, uh, sort of started and grew in the 19th century um as christopher king put it in one language and two scripts um starting from the kind of colonial um state decision to uh, you know to be inconsistent in matters of education and um administrative and sort of legal policy so that uh, colonial education limited though it was was uh, in um in in the north uh, northwestern provinces both uh, in hindi and urdu but the administration and the law courts when uh, farsi was replaced by the uh, regional vernaculars or regional languages was in urdu only of course uh the aftermath of 1857 and the kind of whole change in the sort of the the, the balance uh, of authority and power of course didn't lead to the demise of urdu at all uh 19th century is very much a, a century in which uh, urdu is very strong but what you have is in the 1860s 1880s 1890s 1900s and further you know this sort of consolidation of um and mobilization of uh the hindi hindu public around uh the um issue of hindi the recognition first of nagri as a script uh uh for in 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 the law courts and in the administration as a language of nokri with the kind of symbolic victory of 1900 um a mobilization that also got entangled with um 
sort of a, a new discourse about history hmm? and uh, sort of ancient medieval and modern history with very much what I call the kind of when Muslim came uh, to explain all kinds of social uh, and ills and sort of cultural decline with issues of crop protection and so on. And, and what we see is kind of really a crystallization um, under the under a kind of new discourse of language, a new discourse of language that comes, yes, from Europe, from Enlightenment and romantic romanticism in Europe, but that very much is taken on uh, very sort of vigorously by Hindi um, activists and political activists too, with the idea that you have a mother tongue uh, and you should be true to your mother tongue. If you are if you are educated or you write or read in another language, then your mother tongue you are a, you are a, you are a uh, you know traitor to it. So if you are a Hindu who is educated in Urdu or Farsi, you were a traitor to you, to, and you were not doing seva huh, to your mother tongue. Of course, the idea that Hindi as the daughter of Sanskrit was the authentically Indian uh, language, whereas Urdu as possibly the daughter of Persian or uh, would not be authentically Indian or no? Urdu, the, the whole long standing debate that has been debunked um, by um, Dr. Shamsurman Farooqi most beautifully, but keeps coming up of Urdu as the language, mistakenly understood as the language of the Horde, and so associated with the invasion and so on. Debate that was also, you know, conducted on ostensibly neutral scientific terms of, you know, what is the, what was the most scientific or easy or practical script, because these were uh, debates that had to do with um, identity, but also with practical methods of education. And what we find is we find what we have still now, a kind of a, a crystallization, an association, a clustering of script, language, and community. So that you know, Hindi has to be written in Nagri. Hindi is that which is written in Nagri script and is the language of the Hindi, Hindu community. Urdu has to be written in the Persian Urdu script and is the language of, hmm, question mark, very much uh, part of this um, of this sort of mobilization uh, that led to, both to a discursive divide, but also very much a kind of um, a divide in terms of histories, in terms of literary histories, in terms of uh, uh, archiving and scholarship. Were um, literary associations first of all the Nagari Prachani Sabha of Banaras um, established in 1893. And what this produced uh, were kind of competing geographies. Uh, so here we have two examples uh, where, where sort of proponents and scholars or activists of Hindi and Urdu sort of try to say that, you know, no, Urdu came first, no, Hindi came first, no, Urdu came first, no, Hindi came first. Uh, so if Hafiz Mahmoud Sharani finds in um, sort of fragments, uh, what I call traces of uh, Urdu fikre, or Dohre, which are actually not in sort of Kariboli Urdu, what we what we understand now, but in some kind of Hindui, um, he sees them as enough evidence that this was language. Again, you can see the community uh, identification was the language commonly spoken among Muslims in this period, and it was Muslim peoples, communities, Akwam, who created a special language for themselves. Uh, the Nagari Prachanit Sabha here summarized by Christopher King. So then competitively saying, no, no, we, we were there even before. And despite the lack of any uh, evidence, um, would say that no, we, Hindi existed before uh, the invasion. Uh, so Prithviraj Raso, which later kind of came to be identified more with the 15th century in the kind of reductions that we have, but attributed by Chand Bardai, and pre the pre period of Pridviraj, so you know, at the time of the of the um, of the invasion, um, and the idea that the invasion uh, prevented the fur further progress of Hindi. And if you go to the kind of very, um, you could say, very watered down uh, explanations of the four periods of Hindi literary history, so you know the, the Raso. 
Kali is the Virgata Kali is the first one. Then you've got Bhakti because, as 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 it was explained to me when I was learning Hindi at the Kindri Hindu Sasthan in Delhi, you know, then you know Hindus turn inwards uh, with the invasion, and so they turn towards Bhakti, and then under under foreign. Um, you know, rule, they became enfeebled, and then you have, you know, Riti poetry uh, until the modern period. And although this has been, you know, I'm not saying that this is still necessarily the way in which uh, literary history is uh, taught at university level, I think very much at school level, um, you know, this kind of divisive, hmm? divisive competitive uh, language camps huh? um, and divisive history of language and of literature is still very much uh, with us. Um, so, um, and, the, and the attempt in a way to, um, to um, or, or, or let's say before, before the divide, I understand that before the divide as a title suggests uh, that before the divide there was one language. And actually, this is not what I'm going to argue today or what I have argued. Um, so, and in fact, the attempts, uh, you could say, the attempt like that of Hindustani with the Hindustani Academy, uh, also Gandhi, Premchand, others to sort of push Hindustani, not in the colo British colonial sense, but in the sense of the common language, did not really, um, was not really successful hmm, in, the, in the kind of polarization and the divide of the 1920s and 30s, because Hindustani then was really considered as a kind of minimum common denominator. And this was really not enough to represent, um, you could say, the broad range, uh, and certainly the cultural, the literary, uh, the poetic, um, but also uh, range, you know. There wasn't space there for Tulsidas, for um, for Surdas or for Ghali, uh, Hindustani was considered to be too much of a kind of practical language. So my point today, um, and yes, both Deli David Lelivel and David Lan have written uh, very well about you know, the attempt uh, to, to, to um, put forward Hindustani as, um, as, the, common, uh, as the common language uh, and the common ground the middle ground. But in fact, uh, today instead, what I want to argue is that instead of this language script continuum uh, that separates Hindi and Urdu, um, but instead of positing one language that then got divided, I think it works much better, it's much more um, also historically accurate to think of a range of languages and scripts. Um, languages, scripts, and styles. Uh, um, so a, re a range of high languages that were, uh, that you had to learn. Mm -hmm. So this was not your matri bhasha, uh, unless you were, of course, from a Farsi speaking family. But, you know, these were the languages that probably you would have more investment in. Uh. Then we know that in the whole kind of um, um, sort of pre, uh, you could say, pre-18th century period, uh, we, you have very generic languages. Uh, and in fact, it's very confusing uh, from the point of view of today because you, you know, in, in kind of Hindi sources, anything that was vernacular was called just bhaka, bhasha, language. Uh, so there was no, no distinction made uh, between say Avadhi or Bhujpuri or mm, they would just be bhaka. Uh, only when Bhasha becomes a recognized um, uh, poetic vernacular, as Alison Bush and others have shown, does it then actually get named uh, as, a, as a separate uh, language. Uh, and, and we know that in, in, in Persian sources, you have Hindi for basically, or Indian uh, for basically either Sanskrit or, Hin or any form of the vernacular. Mm? And it's also called Hindui or Hindavi, eh? so the language of the Hindus. Um, and then, of course, with um, uh, from uh, the 
sort of late 16th, uh, early 17th century Brajbhasha becomes a very widespread uh, poetic uh, language. Tulsi Das writes in, in Brajbhasha, although he's not a Braj speaker. Um, and Rechta, uh, then called Urdu, uh, uh, first in the Deccan and then in North India, also starts to get used as a literary language. So uh, a range, uh, a range of languages, uh, a range of poetic styles rather than one language. Um, and um, and scripts too. Uh, so instead of this kind of cluster and, and sort of um, necessary relation between language and script uh, that we get in discourse from the 19th century, language discourse from the 19th century onwards, you find that actually the same text can be written and copied in different scripts, depending on, you know, who is it for, who is the scribe. Uh? So let's take these three examples of Malik Muhammad Jayasi's Padmavat. Uh, one is copied in Gorakhpur in, uh, in Persian script, all illustrated, so all with a certain investment. One, interestingly, is copied in Keti. Uh, this is a rare... Um, and, and a few folios in the Bharat Kalabhavan in, um, in Benares, and this other, so probably early 19th century copy in Nagri. Mm -hmm. So, what? So obviously, script is not a kind of determinant of what the language, you know, or what this text is is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. This text, well, according, you know, would be called in, in Hindavi, now we would call it Avadhi, but the script depends on the, on the scribe. Um, so I would say that before the divide, uh, rather than one language, uh, you have, we have to think of languages in terms of education and distinction. So typically you would learn, uh, and, and uh, uh, you would learn a language that was not the one spoken by your mother. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's better to think about tastes rather than identity, tastes and practices. And again, um, and this is a useful uh, phrase that Ramya Srinivasan has suggested to me, to think about um, the, uh, instead of language communities, uh, which again has this sense of, you know, um, uh, already, in, you know, you're born with a language and this is it, and that's the community to which you belong. Instead, uh, communities of taste. Uh, so, what you what you like, what you what you affiliate yourself to, which actually uh, is is more similar to um, Michael Warner's idea of a public. Uh, so, a public is created by an utterance, by a text. Uh, it sort of it, it assembles uh, a public, one or more publics. In fact, you could say. Um, and for that reason, uh, and, and I tend to, uh, so I tend to prefer to think rather than one language, take this sort of range, uh, linguistic range, and, and think of a multilingual perspective. Uh, we tend to think of, we tend to do literary history, historians tend to do literary histories starting from one language. And that actually, for me, is already kind of problematic uh, within a society in which spaces were multilingual, in which people uh, and their bodies were multilingual. And text, I so if I think of spaces and bodies as multilingual, then I think of text as kind of happening somewhere in the middle. Uh, and one of the very, very sort of um, persistent questions that I've had throughout my you know, research on trying to do a multilingual literary history of Purab or Avad, uh, has been, well, if everybody was, or mo many people were so multilingual, if the spaces were so multilingual, why aren't there more multilingual texts? Um, and, and, you know, we can talk about it later, hmm? uh, about this, which is an interesting question. Um, this is, of course, not to say that there are no, there aren't multilingual texts, but what you more often find are kind of traces, uh, what I call traces. Uh, and here are three interesting examples. And why I th find them interesting is because, you know, in a way, um, whenever I talk about multilingualism, people never have a problem. It's, of course, 
and if I, it sort of lends, leads to generalization. Everybody is multilingual. Uh, multilingualism has always been there. But actually, I think that when you start looking at texts, uh, um, it's rather than a general point, you're, you're forced to ask particular questions about the people behind them, the communities of taste behind them, the practices behind them. So um, um, the one on your left is a folio from a manuscript, in fact, at Aligarh of the Haqqaiq e Hindi by Mir Abdullah Wahil Bilgrami. Uh, it was um, republished recently by the Center of Persian Studies. This is a Sufi Risala uh, in Farsi about, you know, what do you do if, if as a Sufi, you know, seeker, you listen to uh, songs in, in Hindi, so in Bhaka, in Hindi, probably more like Braj Pasha from the little fragments that we can hear, we can, uh, you know, we can detect. Um, either songs that have to do with um, Sarapa or Nakshik, or with the seasons and other songs, or with Krishna. And it's very interesting because um, it's obvious that Mir Abdul Wahid is very familiar with the Krishna theology, but he's not really interested in that. In fact, he gives a completely you know, alternative Sufi interpretation of these terms. Now, why, why, so what you see in red are the Hindi, um, I'll just say Hindi just to, as, a, as a sort of shorthand, Hindi or Hindavi maybe, um, phrases uh, um, or verses or words. Hmm? Um, so, you know, I can't, rem you know, it's too small here now, but, you know, there's a whole, uh, whole um, chapter on, you know, Jashoda and Kanha and then the monk and the Nena and so on. Now, what is interesting here for me is like that this is a trace of a larger practice. So the text itself is not really multilingual. It doesn't give the whole text of the song. So we don't really know what songs they're listening to. But we know that behind this text, there is a practice, a regular practice of listening to Bishnupad, as he says, and Drupad. Uh, the larger um, um, manuscript um, section of, at the bottom is in fact an early manuscript of Jaisis Padmavat held at the Rampur Raza Library. And, and what you find is really interesting is that, you know, it's a, uh, so it's Hindavi or Avadi as we would call it now, but you can see that the, it's all vocalized um, with, the, all the, uh, with the whole, um, the sort of the short, the short vowels to give a precise reading of the text. And again, you know, so rather than just saying, oh, it's multilingual, this forces us to ask, okay, is this meant for somebody who is really wants to copy it very, very carefully? Huh? So it's a, is, it a, is it an effect of a, of a kind of editorial, you know, philological practice? Or is it because, in fact, it was copied in Western UP and this is not really already a language that is very familiar? Hmm? Interestingly, it also has little glosses, quite generic glosses in uh, uh, that either translate. Uh, uh, so kinha is translated as karda hmm, or karda u. Um, if you have meru, it will be translated uh, glossed as kuh uh, and so on. So again, think it's a, it's a, it's in Hindavi, but meant for a, a Farsi reader. Hmm? And the last one I'll come to in a moment. Uh, so I think it's really interesting then, that's what I mean that, you know, texts are in between spaces and people, and you could say communities of taste. And these are traces that make us ask these larger questions. Now I want to give you two examples mm, um, uh, of, you know, multilingual, you know, what, what it was, uh, how, I suppose how individuals and people uh, were um, multilingual before the Hindi Hindu Hindi Hindu Hindi Urdu divide. Now, this is an interesting uh, short autobiography of about twenty pages, written by a clerk uh, from Chunar. I found it in the UP State Archive Manuscript Library in Alapur in Allahabad. Now, Bhanu Pratap Tiwari. Um, 
in this short autobiography basically tells us about his education. Um, and his education is basically about learning languages. So, um, and you can see that, you know, first his grandfather made him learn Hindi, probably, you know, more like Braj, uh, Braj and Sant couplets by heart. He gives a whole list of them as part of another manuscript there. Then he also teaches him Sanskrit. He gets to, um, to read the Prem Sagar, uh, Balalu Jilal, so this kind of modern Fort William College Hindi text, but also Tulsidas, so Avadhi. Then he studies Farsi at the Chunar Mission School, the, you know, the basic, the Bostan, and then goes on with his father and with the Molvi, uh, reading more sort of Persian classics. At the same time, he also attends a satsang, so he would sing and listen to devotional poetry. The, the family in, are, in fact, uh, devotees, I think, if I remember correctly, either of Paltudas or one of the, one of the sort of other sons. Then um, he continues study of Farsi at home, but he also starts reading, starts studying English at home with Ballantyne's primer, a kind of common primer of the time. For three years, he manages to go to an English school, which he loves. He thinks says it's a parikhana, and it's a, there's boys and girls there. But then his father gets ill and has to retire from his job, and so he starts working um, at the Chungi office, I think, in Chunar, but continues self-study of English. So I just wanted to check whether I think I've been yeah, so this is what I mean by, you know, instead of thinking about language as identity, let's think of it in terms of education, of tastes and practices. Mm -hmm. uh, so what are Banu Pratap's literary tastes and practices? Well, he learns, uh, you know, he has uh, his Prajbhasha Dohe, uh, he knows courtly Hindi, he also has the devotional, you know, more mm, sort of Kabir and other sons type of poetry in through the satsang. He has read the Persian classics, poet, prose and poetry. He also uh, has a couple of uh, couplets that he quotes in his uh, um, autobiography. Um, yes, these are some of the dohe that he remembers his uh, grandfather teaching him. He has some English knowledge. I don't know if he read actually English books. And although he's in fact a contemporary of Bartendu, we don't, I don't really know whether he, you know, he read much modern Hindi. Uh, as you can see here, occasionally, and again, this is a kind of trace of something that you, you would ex perhaps expect it to be find more of, he translates a, a Farsi uh, couplet into Braj Pasha. Interestingly, what does he do as a writer? And uh, so he translates, he has a translation of the Gulistan um, in Hindi. And, but also I found him really, and I was, you know, delighted, of course, when I did, that uh, probably in his work, in his Nokri, he came into contact with William Crook, the editor of North Indian Notes and Queries. And so he was one of those, you know, Malvis and Munshis who contributed to, you know, the sort of snippets of local uh, songs or poems or curios to North Indian Notes and Queries. Here, a sort of, a, he calls it the religious songs of the Dhobis. Pahli naam le alamiyaka duje nabi rasul. A kind of Muslim folklore that in fact is absent otherwise from Hindi folklore collections. So you could say, what is Bhanu Pratap's language? Is it one language? Is it Hindi wala? Or is it in fact this whole range of languages? Let's think of Bhartendu Harishchandra, uh, his contemporary in, in Benares. Again, you know, clearly from a much higher social uh, class, um, but, you know, not such different education, in fact. Uh, again, uh, taught at home Hindi, Urdu, Sanskrit. His father was a Brajbhasha poet, so he, he becomes a Brajbhasha poet. He also studies Sanskrit with several pundits, in fact. He has some a couple of years at Queen's College uh, in, in Benares, but in fact doesn't really take to it and leaves it. He also learns Bengali and he learns music and cultivated intercourse with uh, the wives in Benares. Uh, 
And what, what is really interesting, uh, of, though of course Harish Chandra is known as the kind of father of modern Hindi and you know, his famous Nij Bhasha Unnati Yahe Sab Unnati Komul, um, and, and in fact, although he was quite vocal uh, with, uh, for example, the Hunter Commission uh, for you know, primary education, um, you, know, you could say if we look at his language ideology, he's, he's very much part, you could say, of um, the language movement and, and the divide. Mm -hmm. So one sort of rehashing one of those um, Hindi uh, sort of discourse about Urdu being the language of dancing girls and prostitutes, of course, the dancing girls that he actually went uh, and um, sort of um, consorted with. Um, and, you know, the whole thing about, you know, the, how it's more difficult pronunciation and unpleasant and unnatural and so on. But then if you look at his literary taste, again, they're very eclectic. Huh? They are, um, you know, you have Rajbasha poetry from Samasya Purti to sort of song, Tumri, uh, Chaiti, and so on. His plays are full of Braj and Urdu songs. Um, he, his essays are very, you know, have a whole range of, uh, of language registers, some san sort of macaronic Sanskrit, macaronic Ma Marathi, some sort of English. And he even tried some Urdu verse with the Takhallus Rasa, as uh, Sagri Sengupta has shown. You know, not uh, nothing very complicated, but, you know, again, he was experimenting uh, and he was trying and he was eclectic. And, and sometimes, you know, we are surprised by his eclecticism, but in fact, I think it's a very, um, very sort of common huh, eclecticism. Uh, and a common uh, eclecticism of taste, I would say, that has in fact um, sort of continued even after the, the language divide. So the language divide has been very influential at the level of uh, discourse at the level of ideology, at the level of institutions, of course. Uh, but I think at the level of taste, uh, there are still, you know, a lot of you know in intellig widespread familiarity and intelligibility as you find in you know anything from uh, Parsi theatre and um, you know later cinema. And in fact, it's quite interesting that you know barring Persian you could say, or, you know, Persian and Hindi. Otherwise, the range of tastes that Bhartendu um, and Bajid Ali Shah have is not, is not different. Hmm? Um, not, certainly not that different. Hmm? Now, to come to, uh, sorry, just check, keep an eye on the time. Uh, so to come to the volume before the Hindi-Urdu Hindi divide, in fact, again, the essays in the book do not really point to, you know, a single language. Huh? Um, as Professor Rezavi was saying, we rather thought that, you know, by uh, investigating, you know, not necessarily minor, but, you know, interstitial, huh? so intermediary or interstitial genres huh? between the kind of mainstream genres that we associate Hindi and Urdu with, so Ghazal or um, you know, Rajvasha poetry, um, Bhakti and Riti, we actually find um, a whole range of other genres that, you know, it's more difficult to say what do they belong to. They really come out of this multilingual range. So Imre Banga, for example, um, shows that the consciously mixed language is there uh, not maybe majorly, but it's there uh, from, you know, Sufis, even at the Mughal court, um, certainly in this sort of interesting, persistent genres of Paramasas with the sons and so on. Uh, so Dadu, um, uh, Nanak, you know, you have sort of the, the, the sort of attempt uh, at mixing um, Farsi and some version of Hindu Vibraj uh, in a whole range, uh, a, a whole range of people. Alison's Bush, the much uh, missed Alison, uh, 
uh, article was much more about, okay, how do we understand um, particular choice of register, so sort of Shelley style, uh, um, choice of words in, say, Rajvasha courtly poetry. If, if you have more Persianized words, uh, do, they, do we have to think that they necessarily carry a motivation, a meaning, or can they be also just wordplay mm, with, with sound and so on? Um, Thomas de Bruyne's essay was about how um, the uh, kata, uh, Sufi, prem kata, prem kata, uh, as I prefer to call the premakyanda. So the Sufi romance um, writers like Jayasi, uh, Qutban and so on, how they consciously uh, played with their, but also their audience's familiarity with uh, the Ramayana uh, or characters from uh, the Puranas or from the epics. Um, Lalita Duperon looked at, um, again, language mixing or the particular range uh, of uh, registers in Khayal song texts. Um, Christina Oesterheld um, said, well, actually, even within Urdu, you know, we, even with Urdu, you have a range of registers. In fact, even within the Marcia genre itself, you can go from quite Persianized to very homely, uh, particularly in the more emotional moments. Uh, you would go to a more homely, or what in Hindi we would call a more tadbhav uh, register. Meher Faruqi, uh, wrote a really interesting article on early Quran translations uh, to by the sons of Shah Waliullah, uh, sort of uh, late 18th century uh, Delhi. And again, maybe because, or probably because they were aimed at um, you know, women or you know, those who could not read either in Arabic or Farsi, the register chosen is actually a very, what we now we would call a very Hindi one or a very kind of a, a demotic one, a very colloquial one. Again, this is not to say that this is their language, eh, but this is a choice. Eh? So, Ushota um, Magraval in his book on Kabir, Kabir um, has written very eloquently on what he calls birth determinism, the fact that when we talk about pre-modern um, individuals, we think that, you know, their birth determines everything. So, oh, so-and-so was born, you say, a kaya, so that mostly must have been, uh, whether it's caste or religion. And instead, it's important to um, recover and to imagine uh, that they too uh, exercise choices, that they too had a range. Uh, they, of course, within a, what we would call uh, in literary theory, a kind of a certain horizon, a horizon of expectation. Now, you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't go beyond uh, what was possible or what was imaginable at that time, but within the horizon of what was imaginable, people had uh, choices and had, um, you know, could, could choose and could play. Um, and finally, uh, Valerie Ritter shows how, you know, the, again, there's a whole range, uh, a whole number of poets in the late 19th and early 20th century, even, even those who, you know, publicly are committed to the Hindi cause, like, um, uh, like Hariod, Ayodhana Singh Upadhyay Hariod, they are still, uh, you know, their communities of taste still include Urdu poetry, Brajbhasha poetry, uh, and rather than think of them as kind of contradictions, oh, they are saying one thing and doing another, I think it's probably, for me, it's more productive to think of it as a, as a tension uh, between a language ideology that is sort of hardening and is becoming more exclusive and exclusionary, and tastes that are, um, you know, more, uh, more eclectic. Uh, there's uh, this wonderful uh, character in Rahi Masum Raza's novel Topi Shukla of, um, of Topi's um, grandmother who, you know, loves Persian poetry and hates Muslims. And of course, for him, you know, and for, the, for Topi and for the novel, this is a kind of, you know, a paradox and a, 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 a contradiction. But I think it's probably not a, you know, 
is not is not so unusual in the sense that aesthetics and ideology can often be um, you know in tension with each other. Okay, so I'm coming towards uh, the end. I don't want to keep you too long. So before the divide, then showed again to come back to my main argument that instead of there being one language, you know, the same. So often in public in public discourse about language, we say, oh, before the Hindi-Urdu divide, the language was one. Actually, I don't think the language was one. I think there were these different ranges uh, of uh, literary languages, of spoken languages, um, and, and poets and writers could either play with register, uh, shift, uh, and they could sort of um, have multiple uh, registers. Just look at Guru Nanak in the in the in the Guru Granth. Or I worked for my book on Avad. I worked on Malukdas in uh, uh, the poet from Kala uh, near Allahabad, and he like or Paltudas uh, who moved to Ayodhya. And what you find there is really a range uh, of, of uh, you know, they could um, they could compose, uh, you know, in, in more Brajvasha language, in more Urdu language, in sort of mixed uh, farce, quasi-Persian, as I say, when you're with most of the words and phrases are in Persian and you have a few Hindi words um, here and there. They had this range within them. Mixed language was then a particular choice. Uh, and a particular experimentation often, kind of by heart experimentation in some case, uh, uh, because obviously the language of um, Afsas Bikat Kahani, of some of the other Paramase who are in the Urdu Paramase who are in the voice of the Virahini. This is a Virahini who speaks both in a very demotic, Bahihun Dard Sogivani, and then. Uh, and then have whole Farsi um, sort of um, speech. And it's not so much that, oh, we can imagine her as a character who speaks both, but really a kind of play uh, with mixing the two aesthetics uh, and the two poetic languages. And what for me is really, really interesting about this is that, um, although, we, as I, again, without wanting to say that, you know, oh, every, everybody understood everything. And in fact, that's why for me it's important to, to keep cultivation separate from intelligibility. Um, you know, you could under, more or less understand Farsi, so to say, without necessarily being cultivated in it. Hmm? if you heard it often enough. Uh, yeah, so, um, and so after the divide, then my question is, what happens uh, when we try to do literary history from this multilingual perspective? Uh? So maybe even continue to do history of Urdu or history of Hindi or history of Farsi, but knowing that there are these other languages around, and in people's bodies. What happens when we follow fashions and tastes and practices instead of single languages? What happens when we think that, okay, actually, you know, before 1750 in Lucknow, which is, of course, the, one of the capitals of Urdu, there wasn't really Urdu, uh, you know, being written there. What do people do before then? What did they like before then? Uh, well, and you discover that they probably they they if you if they cultivated poetry, they would probably cultivate Farsi and Brajvasha. That's what Raslin does in in Bilgram. Whereas as Urdu becomes fashionable, the Urdu poetry becomes fashionable. Brajvasha in in Lucknow becomes only a language associated with 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 songs, uh, for example. So what, what happens when we temper our focus on language ideologies with one on tastes and explore then instead this gap, this sort of uh, tension uh, between ideologies and tastes? And what happens when we think of ourselves as multilingual beings, uh, as instead of belonging to this camp or that camp 
do we have to you know choose a camp or can we can we be both hmm? can we be three things huh? can we shift hmm? uh, and finally this is what i've tried to do in uh, you know in my in my in the book that i've just finished um on um, multilingual literary history of, of Purab uh, or Avad, where I've tried to take a multilingual approach, a spatial approach. Uh, so trying to say, okay, if I'm focusing on the on the on the Kasbah of Bilgram, we know more about the, the Persian poets there, but what can we find about the other languages there? What can we find about um, Brajbhasha poetry there? And there are traces. Um, there are uh, there are archives. There are sources. What would you think of Maluk Das as a sant poet in a kasbah like Kara, surrounded by uh, Sufi establishments? Uh, we actually find that his biographer acknowledges one of them uh, in in the Parchai about him. What happens if we think that most of the of of the genres of um, early modern uh, lit literature, you know, so poetry, song, storytelling, they were um, sermon, sermonizing, uh, were all orally recited. Huh? They were listened to, heard, and overheard. And this was true both of the sort of vernacular languages, the, uh, the Bhaka and the Hindavi, but also of Sanskrit, of Persian, uh, they were recited. People listen, uh, like in English, English today. You know, people use English words and phrases even if they haven't been to English school. And I think that was true also in the early modern period. Uh, so this is what we explored with Catherine Schofield in Tellings and Texts, which you can download free uh, online. So for me, uh, the history of Avad is very much a history of a from a from a spatial approach where space is not one thing but it itself is a multiplicity of stories and trajectories and if you think how have i done it well i've tried different uh, approaches so in one chapter i've tried to sort of follow uh, one genre uh, this so like like historians you know follow you know one commodity so i've tried to follow one one genre a few texts from Avadhi or Hindavi into Farsi, into Urdu, and into Hindi literary history. I had a, a chapter on this sort of Sant orature in the located in the Kaspas, a chapter on poetry cultivation, uh, so, so this kind of conscious cultivation of um, distinction and sophistication in Persian and Brajbasha. And then as uh, the two cities, the two capitals of Lucknow and Banares became kind of literary centers, what kind of you know literary um, public literary culture uh, there was with similar uh, kind of um, although with different of course different inflections and different proportions, but with similar public literary culture of theater, songs, and print. Okay. Uh, and if you just have a sense, uh, this is a, 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 a picture from a, an illustration from a manuscript of one of Mir Hassan's uh, Masnavis, Eid uh, Kitehniat, about the bazaar in Faisabad. Uh, so you can just imagine the life of literature in, you know, and you've got storytellers, you've got singers, you've got uh, people uh, chatting and talking. Uh, you, you, you can you, you can you can certainly almost list here uh, the the cries of sellers and uh, and of storytellers so I think it's this sort of range uh, uh, rather than one language it's the range thank you uh, thank you very much uh, for a very illuminating lecture uh, on this divide of the languages. I mean, your span was, I mean, uh, quite wide. I mean, starting from before the divide and coming uh, down to what we have to do now. Uh, any questions or comments? Uh, has any question come up? Let me check. Uh, well, uh, 
you know, let me uh, uh, possibly uh, frame a question first so that the others may also uh, follow suit. And that is that, uh, you know, uh, when you talk about different registers of languages, I mean, how would you uh, define a text, uh, for example, like Taskira uh, Pir Hassu Teli, which was uh, compiled, composed during the, it's a versified uh, account, uh, during the reign of Shah Jahan, uh, it, which it is written in Persian. Uh, the I mean the language ostensibly is Persian, but half of it, uh, you know, mm -hmm. contains Hindavi words. Mm -hmm. uh, so much so that that uh, if uh, a Persian knowing scholar wants to translate it, it <laughs> would be very difficult for him to translate because there are so many Hindavi words, nice. and a pers person not knowing Persian knowing mm -hmm. Hindavi would naturally uh, be unable to decipher what is written out there. It's, in other words, a very difficult text to understand. Nice. Now, where would you place nice. such texts in this divide between Hindi? So, so in this range, uh, as I said, you know, in this range. Uh, so yeah. I, I, I think, I, I mean, one of the, um, you know, I think one of the points on which we, uh, and we, I say we, as the sort of members of the of the of this earlier project on North Indian literary history and culture, out of which those books and conferences came out, very much insisted was was also to think of the so-called you know high languages as themselves having a range in them, no? Because again, it's very easy to think of um, Farsi or Sanskrit as exclusively high languages, no? Um, and I mean, one of my regrets was, in fact, that I really didn't find, although I asked various Sanskritists, but they're not really interested so far. I mean, I hope they will be in um, what in, um, you know, for example, in Italian literary history, you would call low Latin. Hmm? So Latin, very similar thing, you know, so Latin, which is so full of, you know, demotic words. Hmm? So, uh, I mean, in Italy, there was a, it was a clear reason because um you know the, the catholic church insisted on on latin being the language of the church but of course people did not understand latin in the middle ages so you know preachers had to kind of always try and and you know make something that ostensibly was latin into something much more um, demotic that people would understand and my sense is that you know i mean i, I often think of of Farsi in terms of English now, you know? So I think in the in the same way that English now in India is, you know, can be spoken and used at many different levels huh? and with many different, um, you know, many different styles, greater or lesser presence of, you know, um, Hindi or other, you know, regional words and so on. I think that, may have been probably, you know, true of Farsi as well, you know, where, you know, you would probably be, be very careful about what Farsi, uh, if you if you were well-educated, you you spoke, and certainly when you wrote, you, you tended to use, uh, um, you know, to say also and so, that uh, Hindavi goft, but, you know, write it in, in Farsi, and then occasionally have texts like the one that you mentioned, where instead, you know, you would have more, um, demotic words in there. Huh? But I think so. I think, you know, the more we do this kind of textual exploration with an open mind huh? and without, in, in a way, immediately started thinking, oh, Farsi means this, or Hindi means this, or Urdu belongs to that. But in fact, exactly raise it as a question. Hmm? Okay, what is, what is this text? Huh? What is the language of this text? Who is it by? Who is it for? Where does it sit? Then I think, you know, we think much more in terms of this range rather than... So multilingual literary culture is not about parallel developments huh? uh, so much. It's really about opening up the, the range, I think. Right. Uh, you know, there is another thing which, uh, you know, uh, sometimes uh, uh, concerns me, and that is that... Uh, when we get references that, uh, uh, for example, 
Mullah Abdul Qadir Badayuni being asked mm-hmm. to translate these, uh, you know, Sanskrit sources. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not sure whether Mullah Abdul Qadir Badayuni was in fact uh, well versed in Sanskrit or not. Yes, yes. Uh, he, uh, you know, uh, is consulting the pundits. Uh, the pundits are coming to him, or for that matter, in the Badat Khana discussions, uh, all type of you know, uh, in the Indian uh, you know, uh, uh, Jains and Brahmins and so on and so forth, uh, carrying on discussions uh, with the uh, you know Muslim scholars. Uh, each probably perhaps not uh, exactly well versed in the language of the others. So uh, I mean, what type of uh, you know, go between would have been developing uh, for them to easily understand each other. You know, I ask this question uh, uh, because you know uh, I get a ref- reference from the again from the period of Shah Jahan and from the region of uh, Bilgram, which you mentioned. For example, you said that uh, in uh, Bilgram before Urdu, it was Awadi in which I mean the poetry was being said. Brajbasha, actually, Brajbasha courtly poetry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. More courtly poetry rather than, I mean, they must have, of course, also listened to our, you know, the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I I get, uh, you know, a reference that uh, there there is a nobleman passing by through Bilgram and he is informed about a very well known scholar who is giving a lecture in one of the madrasas out there. Hmm. So uh, uh, this uh, p- particular noble decides to go and attend the lecture of this scholar. Mm-hmm. Uh, he has heard a lot about him. He goes there, and but then he notes down uh, that I could not understand a single word because the lecture which was being given was being given, and he uses the term Hinduvi. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, such examples abound. Right. Uh, I mean, uh, on the one hand, you have uh, those registers which you talked about. On the other, I mean, we have such examples uh, uh, where, uh, I mean, there is a difficulty in understanding each other mm-hmm. and they just label it as Hinduvi. We, I, I just don't know whether it was Avadhi or whether it was uh, Braj or it was what type of dialect uh, mm-hmm. which was being uh, spoken about. Yeah. I mean, I mean, again, I think, you know, it's nice to collect as many, you know, examples of this. And then rather than say, oh, this must have been the language, huh? just 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 stop huh? maybe and just pause huh? and just think rather keep it as a hold it as a question. No, I think what uh, what strikes me in those, uh, you know, I mean, from you know, wonderful scholar Hafiz Mahmoud Sharani. I mean, you know, hats mm-hmm. off, and you know, I mean, but you know, the or, or, or Madam Mohan Valvi on the other side, you know, this sort of urge to say, oh, oh this must have been the language, huh? and this must have been, there must have been a you know, a, a, a common language, and this must have been it, you know. It's not so much that, you know, I, or as a historian, you say, oh, well, we are not sure because we don't have the, the evidence. But, but it's more like, what are the consequences of, of having this particular, you know, of, of giving in this particular urge and saying, because then this becomes a kind of a, you know, we know that this become reiterated and they become, you know, common sense. And, uh, and, and, and then, and then, for example, in Hindi literary history, then, you know, you get all this kind of surprise that, oh, how come, you know, people like um, poets like uh, um, Jayasi or Putpan and so on know their Puran so well, you know, how can they be? You know, though, they, though, the, though Muslims, they write, or Raslin, though Muslims, he writes in very Shud Brajbhasha. You know, so because certain expectations are created about language, identity, what was spoken, what was, rather than, no, than, than sort of thinking that, yes, probably reality was more, you know, um, variegated as in fact it is now, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, although it is not covered uh, in your topic, but uh, uh, how would you define Dakani? Uh, which uh, 
developed during the Mughal period. Right. So I'm not a scholar of Dakani, so I haven't really, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I haven't really studied, you know, I've read a little bit of it. And, uh, but um, from what I understand, again, it's a, uh, so, so again, I don't, and I don't know how much one would say, oh, this was, you know, I mean, my, 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 my caution is always to take literary texts as evidence of spoken language use, you know? because I think, you know, literary, I'm Italian, you know, in Italy, if you were not from Tuscany, you did not speak Italian until the 20th century, basically, you know, some of our most famous poets and writers in, in Italian did not speak Italian, you know, they knew how to write it, but that was not, you know, they knew their regional language and French, that was what we did knew. Um, so again, the idea that um, from, I mean, was it a, was it the vernacular? Was it a vernacular spoken? Uh, was it a, you know, a literary vernacular that develops? Uh, certainly we have a wide range of, uh, of, uh, of texts in it, but we also know that it wasn't the only vernacular at the Deccan courts, no, that there were yeah. other. I ask this question because, you know, uh, certain literary texts were written in this uh, language. I would point out Karbal Katha, for example. Right. So, I mean, I think, so again, there's a, there's been a, a, you know, a tendency to say, oh, this is Urdu, you know, so you construct the, 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 the object Urdu, or you construct yeah. the object Hindi, and then you try to, you know, pull yeah. everything in it. I mean, I think it's pretty clear, uh, and, in, and even in Hindi, you know, scholars like Rambilas Sharma and, and others, you know, have tried to look for this earlier Kariboli uh, sort of text, uh, while in fact the majority of, uh, you know, of, um, of any kind of, you know, religious, non-religious, devotional, uh, you know, Katha or Pad, one was not in Kariboli hmm, before uh, before the 19th century, um, but still, you know, ikke duke, huh? you know, you do find uh, certain texts here and here and there. Um, so, I mean, I also think, for example, the language of uh, Banarsidas and Katana, yeah. quite an interesting yeah. Yeah. one, yeah. because again, it's not it's not Kariboli, it's yeah. not Baj, it's really sort of some, you know. Mm, yeah, um, koine perhaps, uh, or sort of a, and, and he oh, used it. Why only Banarsi Das? I mean, for example, that uh, there are a large number of words in Zakhiratul Khawanim. Okay. Uh, I that, uh, that's a text which deals with the biography of the nobles. Right. But within that, uh, a number of, you know, verses which mm -hmm. are in Hindavi with mm -hmm. so called uh, Khari Boli and uh, Braj and uh, you know, Avadi all mixed into it mm. uh, have been quoted as far as the lives of right. uh, these particular, you know, uh, nobles are concerned. Right. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's not only Barasi Das, but uh, mm. there are, mm. you know, there's one another question. I'm, I'm sorry, we are all laymen as far as you are concerned. Yes. So well, I mean, I'm fine. Our uh, questions are stupid, uh, but uh, please try to, uh, I mean, uh, understand our limitations. You know, uh, uh, let us go back to Amir Khusro, for example. Now, Amir Khusro, in his uh, No Sepeher, hmm. does talk about the uh, Hindui languages, Hindavi or Hindui, however you may pronounce it. And in that, he not only uh, mentions, uh, I mean, first he mentions it in plural. Hmm. I mean, the way he, it doesn't appear to be one single language, as you rightly pointed out. But then uh, within that, when he goes on to define what these Hindu languages are, we get uh, the Avadi and Braj, mm -hmm. which are the different registers of, uh, you know, dialects. But along with that, uh, he also mentions Gujarati and uh, Tamil uh, and, uh, uh, for example, Telugu. Uh, these proper languages are also all those indigenous languages. Yeah. They are different as yeah. Hindu dialects as well as languages. So, uh, I mean, which, yeah, I mean, it's it's you know because it's comparatively rare, and there are not that many you know sort of contemporary or later discussions of language that would sort of clarify 
what is the semantic, you know, um, background of these words. I mean, um, and again, other people have, you know, have, have, are, are more uh, able to talk about it than than me. But I wonder, you know, at his time when, in fact, there isn't really, you know, uh, literature yet in any of these languages known by whether these are kind of terms, you know, name terms uh, and, and uh, names of languages that just come out of the of, of the regions that are recognized. Hmm? So there is a region called Avad and, and thus there will be an Avadi, huh? rather than, oh, this is the Avadi that later on we recognize as Avadi, or this is the Braj that later on we recognize as Braj. No? So I think, uh, um, again, it's very interesting that he should have that, um, you know, that go into that kind of statement, but I don't know if we can take it as a, um, a sort of a, a recognition that at that time those were recognized as you know separate languages because in fact then for centuries as we you know as you say you know Hindi and Bhaka are used for for everything mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's not as if you have a very ingrained uh, sense of of regional language differentiation. Um, after Amir Khusro. Well, Amir Khusro, you know, uh, does accept. He says that I know Hindi. And he also claims that uh, he also used to versify in uh, Hindi. Well, I mean, it's very difficult. For me, it's very difficult to think of anybody who would, uh, you know, live or was born in India. <laughs> Uh, at any time and not know a vernacular language, you know, from that time onwards, you know, even if their whole oeuvre is in Farsi, I mean, what do you talk to in, with your, you know, with your, with your servants, with, uh, you know, with um, ordinary people, mm? you know, you, you, you just, to, I, I think again, you know, we tend to sort of think of the text or the languages as kind of so bounded that, oh, so-and-so is a Farsi no, Farsi da, and then their whole life is in Farsi. You know, maybe their whole oeuvre can be in Farsi, but then, you know, why would, and, and they chose not to. No, that's why also, you know, cultivation, affiliation, they are important terms because, um, you know, you don't want to deny that, but you don't want to, also, you also want to think that, okay, would they have not been, you know, if they'd heard a song or a doha, would they have not understood it? Or a dialogue, or a, you know the the cry of a seller, would they not have understood it? You know, uh, my take from your lecture is that uh, starting from you know twelfth, uh, thirteenth centuries and coming down to late eighteenth century, uh, there were a number of dialects and languages you can say which were present apart from uh, you know uh, Sanskrit and Farsi and Arabic. Uh, which were developing uh, in India uh, uh, through the uh, you know various centuries. Uh, where would you actually put the divide when the people speaking Hindavi would now start claiming that they are speaking Hindi or Urdu? Right. Um... Well, I mean, it's a bit difficult to say, you know, because of course you have also people who kept saying, mm, oh, well, but I, you know, so Hindustani, I think, is one of those yeah. positions then when people would say, well, actually, I'm, uh, uh, and, and it's a position that, then, however, becomes a kind of reaction to the divide, no? Mm? To not, not well, well, would I be correct to say that, that, that uh, you know, this, actually, this Hindi Urdu divide. Mm -hmm. Is after the partition when no, we started no, no. thinking about uh, or in communal lines, or is it no, before? No, no, no. It's, it's. I mean, you, 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 you know. So my, my, as you know, my, my first, uh, you know, my, my PhD and my book were on, uh, you know, the 1920s and 30s, and of course for that I also read, you know, the work, you know, 19th century, and and in Hindi it's very strong, you know, it's very strong. The divide, the sense of, you know. Of uh, alienation, of you know, this whole thing, whole thing of the Muslim came. Huh? The Muslims came, and then you know, 
our society was in danger and, you know, um, you had bhakti poetry, you know, a Hindi could not plus, prosper, you know, all kinds of things. And it's there in in the his, in the history books, is there in the literary histories, in there is there in the you know context historical context of critical essays. So in fact, you know, um, and I think to be honest, I think in Hindi we are still a little bit stuck there, you know. Uh, and in fact, also this is why um, you know when you know when the whole sort of Hindutva, you know, rise of Hindutva in the 1980s, you know, for me, it was like so familiar, you know, this was the language that I had been, you know, so used to in the Hindi magazines and associations of, of, of the, you know. That is what I'm asking. So my point, but my, my point there is that in a way they were, you know, they were kind of struggling against the dominant, you know, Urdu was then the dominant public language, you know. So they were, you know, they were, it, it is this sort of this rise of the sort of, uh, you could, well, I mean, historians, social historians would call, you know, this sort of Hindu, you know, landlord and, and sort of middle castes and so on, uh, bringing together, no, consolidating a kind of a constituency. So it's a 19th century construct you want to say. Yeah, and my, my point, and I think some some question in the chat as well, in the comments, I mean that even in Hindi, this is always attributed to, you know, Fort William College, John Gilchrist, you know, a communal uh, mm. you know, divide mm. and rule. And mm. and although I think this is, you know, A, I mean, the sort of sense of, you know, him, as, as many have pointed out, you know, the sense of, you know, oh, India is a, is a, is a place where, you know, religious identity is, you know, paramount, is very much there in the colonial imagination. So, you know, they think of languages as, uh, yeah, in, in sort of communal terms. But my point is that actually, you know, you can't just blame the British, you know, that, you know, yes. if you see somebody like Madame Malvia or, you know, the Nagri Pashani Sabha, you know, they are really, you know, taken on board and, you know, very actively promoting uh, this kind of and and you know elaborating this kind of view, of course, doing excellent work. Otherwise, you know, the Nagri Prashani without the Nagri Prashani Sabha, we would not have a a kind of a you know a a survey and a collection of Hindi manuscripts, for example. You know, they did you know the library you know was fantastic. You know, a lot of you know scholarly work. You know, so that's absolutely there. I don't you know I certainly don't just want to rubbish. But the cultural um, imagination, huh? I mean, we know, for example, that somebody like Purushottam Dastandan and that whole generation, you know, they knew Urdu very well. You know, it's not as, of course, you know, they had studied Urdu or Farsi, but, you know, ideology, the ideology took them somewhere else. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, can you see some other question yeah. or comment? Uh, yeah. Ah. So, so there are multiple questions. I'll put ah, them please. up. Ah, please uh, put we them. We have up. about ten questions. Ah. So you know the Sushil Kumar colonial identity chess. I mean, I think it's true, but not. You know, we can't just say that. Huh? I think that's to be to de to deny agency to all those activists and and writers. Yeah. Well, I think Hindi as a word comes from India, doesn't it? Hind and Hindi. So it's a it's an adjective of India, as we said, you know, this kind of broad ranging term. Um, yeah, so I... Um, yeah, so I think uh, uh, Mohammed Aftab Alam, I think, you know, that's a bit... Uh, no. Uh, um, Professor Orsini, I'm going to read one question by Nanak Ganguly, mm -hmm. where Nanak says, how do you explain Dakhani Urdu that arose through a series of complex interactions between the local Dakhani uh, vernaculars, Marathi and Kannada, Telugu and a Persianized dialect of Old Punjabi, brought to the south by North Indian settlers in the early 1300s? I believe you've answered this. 
Um, well, and you... I, think, I think the question answers it itself. You know, this is how it comes about. I mean, so uh, just to answer it in a slightly different but way. But now I can see. I Now I can see. I mean, yeah. I'm sorry. So, I mean, the questions were not visible to me. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, so so you know, a very interesting, you know, wonderful uh, work by um, uh, Shamsa Rahman Farooqi, early Urdu literary culture and history, you know, has this question, you know, why, why isn't there more Urdu in North India, early Urdu in North India? Why is it earlier in the Deccan? Or, you know, you have this kind of uh, ghostly Masood Sal Salman in, you know, Multan and Lahore, then Amir Khusro, well, in fact, you know, the, 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 the songs attributed to Amir Khusro, you know, it's not Kariboli Hindi mainly, you know, it's more like Brajbasha type Hindi than... Uh, Kariboli. And then for centuries, huh, nothing. Well, my answer to that is to say that, you know, if you were a, if you were a Farsidan or if you were an Ur, you know, a Sufi and so on and, and wanted to write in the vernacular, then you would write, in the, you know, in the regional or local vernacular. Hence, you have, you know, the, the, the Punjabi Sufis writing in, you know, some kind of early Punjabi, you've got the Avadhi Sufis writing in Avadhi, you know, why would, and, and the Dakini Sufis, and of course with, with Dakini, you've got the difference that it's given sort of a legitimacy and recognition as court, uh, as, as administrative language, which doesn't happen in North India for, you know, much, much, much longer. Well, there is a question by Mehru Jafar, uh, uh, right. question, yeah. uh, how do we make sure that the range of different activities linguistically does not shrink further? further. Well, I think, you know, partly it's um, to continue to, you know, cultivate this taste and be open and listen and, you know, be interested. Huh? I think there's a, I think the sort of the... Uh, the ignorance of the privileged uh, is often quite a, a, you know, what I call what I call a language ladder. Uh, that we we think of languages as led as a ladder. That as you go up, you know, you you give up the the languages that are perceived to be, you know, inferior or the languages that don't get you anywhere. Uh. I think again, for me, the emphasis on takes is is in, is good because it. It, it makes what we what we like to listen to. Huh? I mean, like to listen to Punjabi songs. Why not? Huh? Or like to listen to you know Bhojpuri uh, songs or to you know there's there's plenty out there. It's not as if it's not there. Huh? So if only again, it's often a question of visibility, a question of you know respect, a question of acknowledgement, huh? and. Uh, mm, you know, I have a, a, a friend who was a former professor of education in Delhi University. She says, you know, she always asks the train teacher's trainees, what is your language? And at first, everybody says Hindi. And then when she asks again and asks again and again, it turns out that, oh, somebody is, you know, Chhattisgarhi, somebody is Magahi, somebody is, you no, know, but people do not own those as their as languages, you know. So I think the more you can make, that's why I think it's important to to open up the public discourse on language, you know, to change it from this keme, you know, of you know, languages must be enemies of each other, and you must choose, and you must drop, and you must, you know, if we if we try to change the the public uh, debate, I think there's plenty out there that you know helps us. Uh, um, keep the range uh, as as open. In fact, you know, we know that there are. I mean, you, sort of uh, technologies like YouTube, like earlier cassettes, are great technologies for giving visibility to uh, regional or other varieties. There is a question by Lubna Irfan. When we talk about multilingual uh, spaces, texts and identities, how do we address the public spaces and language languages of the masses? Was there any such thing? Yeah, thank you. So, uh, I mean, that's of course a very good question in the sense that, you know, we have much more, uh, many more 
uh, written textual sources of the elites than the non-elites. Uh, so I think for me, uh, the sort of the one one possible way of getting to non-elite tastes has been through um, well, I mean later on for the 19th century, very much through print, print culture, because there's a lot of non-elite print culture. I mean, that's what my print and pleasure was about, which in fact showed that, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of sort of uh, very common, you know, very, very demotic Urdu, huh? very demotic Urdu. You've got books like, you know, in Urdu on, you know, street criers and songs and this and that, you know, so all kinds of very, very demotic Kista, um, uh, Kiste, for example. Uh, earlier on, for me, one way of getting at this, you know, what would you have listened to if you were not educated, huh, has been uh, through um, through the sons, through the language of the sons, partly because and, and the bani of the sons, partly because we know that they, you know, that they are seeking out and they're trying to, you know, reach. Uh, and in fact. They're they are really, really very eclectic and very diverse. Um, there's, a, there's a passage which I really like a lot in uh, Nirala's uh, sketch, Chaturi Chamar, uh, when he's told that, you know, goes back to his village near Unnao, and they tell him that Chaturi, um, the you know, elderly Chamar in the village, is, um, knows sand poetry very well. And, and, and Nirala says, oh, you know, people so talk about some poetry as poetry, but surely that's not poetry. Anyway, he's convinced and list goes to listen. And so for a whole night, Chaturi and his group, uh, clearly such some type of group, uh, perform. And Nira for Nirala himself is a revelation, you know, the fact that he knew all these songs and he led and led them um, and he names particularly Paltu and Maluk and Kabir, of course, and other and other sons. And the fact is that he says, I can also give you the Vyakya, you know, actually he says, you know, you scholars don't really understand what these poems are about. We know what they are about. So, you know, you have somebody like Chaturi, who's obviously not educated, who has access uh, and not just access as, oh, he has heard, he can sing, he understand, he can interpret the Bani of the Sons. And if you look at the Bani of the Sons, as I say, you know, I've, I've been interested in what I call the three-line sun poets, you know, the ones that, you know, not, not so much the Kabir and the famous ones or Nana or Dadu, but ones that are local to Abad, so like Maluk in Kara or, or um, Paltu in Ayodhya. And, and really they can do anything. And, and they even have this, what I call this quasi Persian. I mean, I could show you if you wanted some, you know, it's, uh, there's some in the, in the grant, Adi Grant as well, Guru Grant. Um, so, you know, you're listening and you're getting, and of course, we know that those kind of songs would then be accompanied, uh, likely by some kind of exposition and discussion, not as part of the satsang. So you're not just listening, uh, you're getting you're really learning about each word and each phrase and what they mean. Well, there is another question by uh, uh, Lubna Irfan, once again. How do we look at journeys of texts like Jayasi's Padmavat, mm. which in modern popular cinema acquired a different identity, meaning and context? It became a symbol of divide, something contradictory to its original Sufi ideals. Yes, that's, uh, I mean, of course, I think like, I mean, for for historians is always uh, dispiriting <laughs> where something that, or, or, you know, scholars, when you think something that means something different is taken to, uh, you know, to give a particular meaning in popular culture. I mean, I think it's part of, I think it's part of this problem, to be honest, of this sort of continuing cluster of script language identity. So you have you know, where it becomes, where a text like Padmavat um, belongs naturally to the Rajputs rather than belonging or being able to be, as Mikhail Bakhtin would say, reaccented, uh, accented or reaccented, given a new meaning, given a different meaning, even created, uh, assembled. Uh, 
by a Sufi poet who makes the, the you know, the Sultan the villain and uh, uh, the Rajput the, the, the hero and the, and the Rajput princess the heroine. And, you know, that becomes in, in unthinkable. So again, the fact that this text then must belong to its natural owners and its natural community, which is that. So for me, this is a kind of, yeah, back projection of the current um, sort, of, sort of, yeah, as I say, crystallization of script language community. Right. Uh, there is a question by Dia Roy. Shagufta, can you pick, put it up? Uh, I, I can't see that question here. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, here, uh, I came across pamphlets written in 1943-44 in Nastali Persian script in Urdu based Hindustani for distribution among Indian soldiers stationed in Germany. How can this be explained in terms of linguistic history? Right. Uh, what, why would you be surprised? I mean, are you being surprised um, that, uh, I mean, there's all kinds of material in uh, in both Hindi and Urdu. I mean, as we actually, as we know, the the army was um, tried to uh, go for sort of Roman script, hmm? most Hindustani, which you know Hindustani often meant because of the kind of the 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 the, uh, the weight of the earlier history of vocabulary or specialized vocabulary, either legal vocabulary or, you know, military vocabulary or other vocabulary. Often we know that Hindustani was a kind of, you know, much closer to Urdu than, than Hindi in terms of vocabulary. But the army, as far as I know, was, you know, tended to go more for, so tended to go for Hindustani with the sense of, okay, the broadest possible language and the common ground also possibly. Uh, so, I mean, they, 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 they taught Hindustani much more than Hindi to their officers and so on. But as far as I know, in fact, often they tend to go for for Roman as a kind of simpler uh, simpler alphabet to teach, um, you know, neoliterate soldiers rather than. But I would not be surprised. I mean, why why not? Hmm? Why would they not print pamphlets in in, in, you know, in Hindustani in Urdu? Hmm? Well, there, there, is a, uh, there are a number of comments by Mr. Ali Heather, but I'll just put up his question. Can you tell us about the adoption of Shah Mukhi in uh, Sikh religion? Because a lot of Sikh texts like Zafar Nama are written in Shah Mukhi. So again, I think this is part of what I say, you know, a kind of a declustering of language and script. Uh, the idea that script is, was really a function of your education, of who you, you were copying a text for, of the education, of course, of your audience and so on. So if, if Farsi was the language of education and higher cultivation among, uh, uh, you know, um, administrators and elites in Punjab, why would they not use Shamuki, no? I mean, so why would they not, you know, in the same way that, uh, you know, the Avadi romances are written mostly in, uh, you know, in, uh, in in Farsi script. So, you know, you would have, you would use that available technology of script, which you have learned, huh? and you would use it for, you know, for, for other languages. I think Again, it's only in a in a kind of from a modern perspective that um, I mean. So in a way, it, it's you could say that it's more unusual in the South Asian in the, in the South Asian context the um, the Sikh insistence on uh, on Gurmukhi as you know. So the 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 the, the, the kind of invention of Burmuki as a script for for the scriptures. I think that must have been a, a really more conscious attempt to self differentiating themselves as a group. That of course didn't mean that Nanak or an and other of the gurus and their disciples also learned Farsi. You know, so that was also part. That's not the only language or only script that they learned. So then that, that you would have texts copied in, uh, in, you know, in, in Persian script. I don't see that 
as an niche as you know unusual at all, surprising uh, at all. Quite correct. Mm. Well, there is a question by uh, Hina Asim. Uh, how do you look at linguistic survey of India in terms of your concept of registers of language? Right. Yeah, the, I mean, so I'm, I'm, as I say, I'm not really a linguist, so I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I, and I have, and I've, I've read, I mean, I've, of course, looked at the linguistic survey and on Grierson's other work on, on Hindi. I mean, interestingly, in the linguistic survey of India, as far as I know, there is no Urdu. And, um, and somewhere else, Ur, uh, Grierson calls Urdu, uh, what was it, something? exotic exotic literary urdu something like that so i think he's got this sense that urdu is not you know is not autochthonous is not you know although of course he would know what it is linguistically but that somehow is not is, is not the has not is not legitimate huh? i mean the thing that i would that i'm that i find interesting about the linguistic survey of india is um and has to do with language mapping so again, the idea, you know, I mean, amazing work, you know, <laughs> incredible, incredible work, uh, incredible scholarship. And I think it's really quite interesting that, uh, you know, the people survey, Ganesh Devi and so on, they, they still look up to it very much. You know? So for me, that's a kind of like a telltale, you know, if they rejected it, then I would be more suspicious. But if they say, no, no, this is, you know, an amazing, because of course it, it surveys not just the major languages, but all kinds of uh, uh, regional um, and Adivasi kind of languages. But what is interesting is it doesn't really deal with multilingualism. It's language, uh, you know, it's, it, it doesn't think that, okay, you can be a Marathi speaker and a Gujarati speaker and, a, and, and no Farsi and no English and, and listen to Braj Bhasha, you know? That sense of a multilingual person or a multilingual area is not there. So that for me is like an interesting, really interesting uh, flaw. Right, there is another uh, question uh, by Ali Heather. Uh, uh, can you tell us history of Urdu in Punjab? I'm asking this because modern legendary poets from Punjab like Iqbal, Faiz wrote in Urdu and not mostly in Punjabi. It was greatly embedded in its culture. Yes. I mean, again, why would you be surprised? No? Why would you be surprised that in a region where, you know, um, Farsi has been there from, you know, very, you know, the earliest works in work in, uh, in Farsi in, uh, in India were written and, uh, um, and Urdu seem, and, 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 and Punjabi seems to have been used for, again, it's more, you know, it's it's a bit like um, so. If you if you if you if you were brought up on on Persian and then um, and then Urdu, you know, it's not that it necessarily has to be your know, the language of your mother. Huh? That's the language of your affiliation, the language of your culture, the language of your sohbat, not the language of your of your yeah of your distinction. Um, I'm sure they understood and spoke Punjabi. You know, <laughs> there's no, there's no doubt about it. But they, they did not write in it. No, that was not the language that they, they, they cultivated. Um, now, are... Farina, Farina Mir has written a very good book on, uh, on Urdu and Punjabi in, uh, in Punjab. And you know, she would, you know, she, I would suggest you, you write it. I mean, she and others make the point that part of it, although of course, you know. You know, you could say that um, Urdu, Urdu poetic culture was already there before the annexation of Punjab. Huh? So, you know, it was already a fashion and it was already cultivated. Um, I don't know about Punjab, but I would be surprised if it weren't cultivated there. Um, that the British chose to, um, in 1830, you know, in, whenever it was, uh, that they, they chose the vernacular for Punjab. They chose Urdu rather than Punjabi as a kind of um, you know, containment of Sikh and uh, possible um, 
uh, you know, rebellion. So I don't, I, I don't know about that, but, um, but certainly, I mean, in a way, that to, to me, the history of Urdu in Punjab is not necessarily that different from the history of Urdu in Awadh or Bihar or, you know, other places where it was not the local language, no? Well, uh, there are a number of comments uh, which have been made. Uh, for example, as you can see there by Elizabeth McClary, uh, who in fact goes on to uh, raise your lecture. Uh, but I would be more interested uh, in uh, another one by T.C. Yeah. Raghav. Uh, uh, he says that uh, the issue from the late 19th century was of script rather than language. Uh, the Persian script, because of its association with Arabic, had a privileged position and dislodging it required a major mobilization, which was so successful that a script movement became a language movement and then a political movement. The mobilization around Urdu bred its own movements. Some communities straddled these uh, divides for a long time, in particular, the Kayats of North India. How active were the Kayats in pre-Hindi Urdu divide period? Were they seen as bridging the gap equally at ease in different registers or were they identified with Urdu from an earlier period? Right. Um, well, so to be honest, I don't think that the first script, then language, then political, I don't really agree because the language of script, the issue of script, if you see the way, you know, when we talk about discourse, you know, when we see the way in which it is couched, uh, the cultural imaginary in which it is couched, uh, early, you know, early on from the 1860s and then early 80s. So it is an agri movement, but it's an agri movement that is that that comes with that sense of history. It comes with a sense of uh, you know this is the you know this is the you know this is the authentic script, and this is the script and language of this community. So I don't think that I would um, I would agree with that actually. You know I think script it's called Nagri movement, huh? but it's not. You know after all it's called Nagri Pracharini Sabha. So the association for the for the uh, you know spread and, and propaganda of Nagri, but it's not just Nagri. It's Nagri and Hindi and that and and that particular Hindi. Um, and that particular sense of community and history. So I don't really agree with that. And to be honest, I mean, if you say were the Kayas already a bridge, it's like you're back projecting the divide. I think, you know, what you find is that in, say, um, 18th century, um, so, dep you know, again, I think, it, you know, if we think of depending on what your profession and your, uh, you know, your, your affiliation, your cultivation, your religious, you know, um, uh, sort of leaning words, uh, you would have a particular range of uh, scripts and um, sort of poetic texts. Just to give two examples, you know, uh, there's um, somebody, uh, sorry, now the title of the name escapes me, um, Puhur, Puhukar. A, a poet, a, a Brahmin poet, well, Bhat, Brahma Bhat, a poet from um, a small village in, um, he's writing in uh, the 16, 16 or 10 or so on. So he says that in his family, they've all been, you know, Brahmin, uh, you know, they've always been, been, been Brahmin scholars. He, um, he himself wrote, in uh, a non-Sanskrit, uh, but um, sorry, all his families were Brahmin Sanskrit scholars, and he also wrote in Sanskrit. He wrote in Brajbasha. He writes a sort of interesting um, avadhi katha that is very kind of Brajbasha leaning and heavy, with kind of like a riti katha, as I've called it. He says, "Oh, I also I, I did ser in Parsi." So he had some, you know acquaintance with um, with Persian poetry. 
So I think depending on, you know, he says that he's somewhere in his family had been, in fact, with, uh, you know, at Akbar's court and so on. So I think depending on, you know, you could be a Brahmin. After all, Chandra Bahan, you know, the, the, on, on whom Rajiv Kindra has written on, you know, he was a, from a Brahmin, but in a family of administrators. So depending what you were, you know, if you were a Padwari, if you were an administrator, if you were a Munshi, then you would have to learn Farsi. And then whatever other languages you wanted to cultivate, you know. So, so it's really interesting that you know you have all these. Um, well, Mirghulam um, Aliazad Bilgrami uh, writes, you know, this, all this Taskire from Bilgrami. He then goes to the Deccan, and there's been a lot written on him. Um, now he's the only one. I mean, there are so many Tazkires, but he's the only one who has a separate chapter in his Sarve Azad on the Persian poets of Bilgram, who are all, eh, I mean, um, in his Tazkiras, they are all um, Sheikh or Sayyids. Hmm? Um, but interestingly, so for him, you know, it's like you have a sense that, oh, in Bilgram, um, Farsidan, again, or some of them, particularly those who are interested in music or in poetry, would also cultivate Brajbasha, not typically Riti Grant, not really Riti Grant, Raslin and, and several others. Now, was it the only one? Were they the only one? Or, or is it just usual because he writes about them? So I think, you know, um, to say, or whether, whether people who are bridging the gap is you're already putting the gap to start with. I think if you if you think about range, I think then it becomes okay. Given your birth, your but your family, your you know, take again, take Banarsidas. I mean, he's a Jain merchant, but he 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 studied some some um, accounting and some basic literacy. He then studied Asiki poetry, which to me sounds very much like either Ur, you know either either sort of Farsi or something. And he writes something that seems like a prem kata, so a prem akyan, which he throws away. But certainly, you know, he 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 uses sort of um, when talking about that, he uses a lot of Persian words. Uh, and then and and then he write, he 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 then does sort of uh, you know more philosophical translations from Sanskrit into into sort of Bradhasha. So you know, depending on your affiliation and your profession. You would have different a different range of languages and tastes. Well, there is a question by M. A. Samar. Uh, uh, Sumar, I, I think. Yeah, uh, he says this. Please correct me if I am wrong. At identity conceptual level, the communal divide was always there in the subcontinent, and Hindi, uh, Hindu, Muslim religious identities were there. But it was actually political motives which catalyzed, exploit the contrast, the contrasting beliefs to antagonistic level. And in this race, we still see violence cycles since centuries in the subcontinent. Well, Mr. Sumar or Samar, I mean, I think I would say your view of history is a bit. Um, I mean, it, it wants to be very simple. Huh? You have one, you know, it's like. Where is the complexity in all this? No, we know that society is complex, people are complex. We want contradictory things. We like this and we like that. Uh, we believe in this, but we also like that. Um, we believe in this, but then we fall in love with that. You know, so that's been going on. So I think the idea. So, and I think there's a certain um, confusion, uh, or or not confusion, a certain kind of again. Uh, collapsing of the idea of uh, religious identity with communal identity. No? I don't, you know, I think when people say, you know, oh, before the modern people period, identities were fuzzier. I think that can often seem quite, it's actually quite misleading. I don't think if you were a Muslim in 14th century in North India, you 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 didn't know what being a Muslim were, was. Perhaps you, but perhaps what was your idea? What was your idea of being a Muslim? What would that allow or disallow? What would that you know? Would that entail enmity? What would it, would it entail? Uh, a sense of superiority? 
So, and I think that's probably also more true, you know, but, but also would it entail that you thought you were Sunni or Shia, you know, would that be Muslim as a sort of overarching or would it be an identity with also different, you know, um, uh, different aspects to it huh? in terms of, you know, Qom, um, in terms of, you know, Vatan, in terms of, you know, again. So I think the idea that diversity has to be enmity uh, and identity has to be, diver you know, has to be divisive, I think this is very much part of a sort of the problem, what I see, you know, the problem of the divide, of saying that, okay, if you have this identity that has to be antagonistic to that, rather than, in fact, you know, it can be alongside, it can be, uh, you know, enmeshed with. Um, you're no less this because you're also like that, you know. So I think um, this idea of, oh, well, there was always, you know, this deep divide uh, is certainly what, you know, what was part of that discourse of mobilization from the from the you know the 19th and uh, and 20th century yes uh, but i don't think that you you know you wouldn't explain so much of the ordinary life of literature of people of exchange you know if you only thought that oh well there was always a civil war about to start you know, and that sort of just didn't always happen you know that's that's not that's not what um, you know. That's not what the sources tell us. Well, there is a, a question by Muhammad Aftab Alam. Uh, he is a political scientist. Uh, do you think that the Hin uh, Hindi Urdu divide was the direct consequence of the colonial design to create the communal schism between majority Hindu community and Muslim minority to weaken the nationalist awakening as a religious divide? Uh, could best be concretized on the basis of linguistic one. Secondly, issue of language is also woven around the control of not only a political uh, and administrative power, but also the creation and manipulation of uh, uh, imagination and thought processes. Uh, Well, I think I've been a bit answered this already, you know, yeah. I think, uh, you know, I, I mean, well, just let me complete. I mean, I the sure. of it was not visible there. Right. In this connection, the Hindi Urdu divide has successfully played its historical role as evident in the current saffron political upsurge in India. That is what he has to say. Uh, right. Um, so I think partly I've, I've answered that before in terms of saying that um, whether we think of it as design, because actually, you know, so I've been, um, sorry, I, I'll come to your question. I've been actually quite re re reviewing my view of Gil John Gilchrist um, of Fort William College, you know, who's always, uh, you know, to whom the, the sort of the divide uh, of, uh, sorry, of Hindi and Urdu is always attributed. Actually, he published a lot of Urdu, you know, literature. He, uh, he's, uh, you know, in a way, we he published all the recent uh, classics of Urdu into at Fort William College as well. So, and he published, you know, all these books in both scripts. So, you know, he didn't. He he thought of, in fact, he thought of uh, uh, sort of um, of Hindi and Hindustani. Uh, or what you call, you know, the, the, the three registers of, uh, of languages as three registers. But then he also said that, you know, the Hindi was the language of the, you know, the rural and the language of the Hindus. So, you know, you, you get both. So I think it, it's more a question of um, um, grab them grappling uh, with this linguistic diversity with their... Um, categories that they apply when they think about India, which I say are, you know, largely religious ones. So the idea that, oh, well, language too must be uh, divided along, along religious lines rather than, you know, you could say, well, language is what, is language is what people speak. You know, I speak and, 
Professor uh, Rezavi speaks English, so it's not as if language, you know, who does English belong to? Huh? Is it a language that we are both speaking, isn't it? No, it doesn't belong to one or to the other. Um, then, of course, I think that the whole sort of divide, uh, the divide and rule, we know that the British did it. But then you have to say that, you know, this is how we can explain the whole process, seems to me to negate the, um, the kind of the, the, the broader social and political process of, you know, the change in, uh, imbalance uh, of power after particularly after 1857 where certainly you know this hindi um you know this hindi elite and their clients sort of um, are not not subordinate anymore no they're not subordinate to uh, uh to the to an avab or to a no or to a um uh, sort of a a, a, a sort of a, a Mughal, Mughal authority uh, in name or post-Mughal authority anymore. So they become much more like the protagonists no? or feel themselves much more as, as protagonists. Um, so, so to think in terms of, and, and, and in their case, are you saying, okay, are they manipulating? Well, I think as usual, I think they believe in it. Huh? They, they, they think that, that that's what they believe in. That's their view of, of history. That's their view of culture. And I think that that's what, you know, and then as, as always at the level of cultural imagination or discourse, you know, we can see a continuity, but it's often best, best to think of it as a redeployment, huh? a reuse. Because if you just think of it as continuity, you don't think of who is doing it and for what and for what purposes. So obviously, uh, the Hindutva uh, sort of, um, you know, the, even the social makeup uh, of, uh, of Hindutva uh, and the BJP is not exactly the same that, like that of the uh, Hindi Hindu organizations of the 19th century. Uh, there are overlaps, but, but, but not just. Uh, and as we know, that's actually um, this particular view of history and this particular view, you know, of of self and other, and this strong othering is a way of consolidating. I mean, that's what my political scientist friend tell me, a consolidating a much broader, a much broader community who otherwise would, you know, um, would not feel so at home in the, you know, for example, in the strong caste, hmm? defense of caste of the, uh, of Hindutva, no? I mean, uh, again, you have it already partly in the uh, tw early 20th century. You know, Nandini Gupta's really great book on the political culture of the urban poor uh, in the early 20th century shows that, you know, uh, or Sandhya Freitag, the Ahir and those kind of, you know, uh, lower castes um, went for, you know, um, Hindu mobilization even then, whereas the Dalits didn't by and large. As we know, in fact, the Dalits were kind of, um, or many of them were actually also kind of preferred the, the colonial rule to the, what they perceived would be a sort of Hindu rule. Now, of course, things are very different. Huh? So rather, you know, rather than thinking it just in terms of continuity of discourse and manipulation and cultural imagination, I think it's more useful to think of it as a redeployment. Well, uh, I will round up the question answer show because uh, it has been almost two hours. So, uh, but, but just one uh, comment and question by Dr. Zoya Zaidi. Uh, her question was put up flash, but uh, we uh, forgot to take it up. Uh, uh, she says, I think expression in whatever language you are comfortable with is the most charming one. It attracts and appeals to the reader and listener. Don't you think so? Absolutely. I mean, I wouldn't do literature if I didn't think that. You know, I think, uh, you know, facade, it can be in any language and, uh, and, and register, you know. And, uh, um, you, know, I, 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 you know, I grew up, well, not I grew up, I, I went to, um, 
to JNU MA uh, Hindi classes for a year and you know listen to Nambar Singh, uh, heard Ramvila Sharma speak and other you know wonderful speakers of Hindi. You know, we're, we're, you know beauty. You know who could put the the most uh, uh, you know complex ideas beautifully and simply. You know, great writers. So I don't think that you know again languages are inherently lacking or have something. You know, uh, and. And and I think the more we can, as, as I say, respect and uh, and appreciate, hmm? appreciate, really like and and have the taste for that, the the richer our society is. You know, my only hope in this sort of um, age of you know the rush for English uh, is that you know this aesthetic sense for um, you know for Urdu for aesthetic and affective, you know, so emotional for you know other bullies and is what will keep the range uh, viable hmm? and uh, and alive hmm? so so that languages again are not just thought in terms of you know functional and transactional and ways of you know becoming you know of of mobilization so absolutely everybody learn english no problem but don't give up the other languages tashakkur hmm. shukriya Mehrbani. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, this uh, session was excellent, beautiful. At least I learned a lot. Uh, you know, uh, this question of language yeah. is a very important one and, and a very sensitive one. Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, uh, today this program uh, uh, on which uh, you presented a lecture uh, was also, you know, uh, published uh, and circulated by the Frontline magazine. Right. And one of the ways uh, through which the history is being, uh, you know, percolated down to the level of the masses. But uh, somebody today itself uh, uh, wrote a comment uh, when I shared this uh, frontline, uh, you know, article, uh, and somebody wrote, "Lekin aapka jo program hai, wo to angrezi mein hota hai, aur bahut se log hain jo usse mehroom reh jaate." Khair, वैसे मैंने कल भारतीय भाषा परिषद के अंतर्गत लगभग यही बातें हिंदी में कहीं. शायद वो भी उनके फेसबुक में आपको मिलेंगी. और वहाँ भी मैंने बाहुभाष्य दृष्टिकोण और की जरूरत और हिंदी साहित्य को के इतिहास को बदलने की जरूरत और इतनी सारी बातें वही हिंदी में कहीं तो दिलचस्प बात यह है कि वहाँ दूसरी तरह की एक तरह से दूसरी तरह की प्रतिक्रियाएं होती हैं और और वहाँ भी एक तरह से हिंदी पे जो आग्रह है उनको लगता है कि इस बहुभाष्य दृष्टिकोण से ऐसा ना हो कि हिंदी पे भी ठेस पहुंचे तो मुझे लगता है कि ये मैं ये बातें आप हिंदी में भी सुन सकते हैं और अंग्रेजी में बिल्कुल सही और फिर मैं अपने जो सुनने वाले हैं सामीन से ये भी कहना चाहूंगा कि हम लोग इनशाला बहुत जल्द अपने प्रोग्राम्स को न हिंदी न उर्दू हम उसे हिंदुस्तानी में जरूर पेश करेंगे और उसको हम सोच रहे हैं कि पहले एक जो सीरीज हमारी चल रही है जो अभी शायद अप्रैल के महीने तक या मई के महीने तक ये चलेगी इसमें ज्यादातर हम ये कोशिश करेंगे कि अंग्रेजी में क्योंकि जो आजकल लित्रताई की जबान है वो अंग्रेजी है जैसे एक जमाने में हिंदुस्तान में फारसी हुआ चाहे वो चंद्रभान ब्राह्मण हो चाहे कोई हो वो फारसी में भले अब्दुल रहीम खान खानान दूसरी भाषाओं में भी अपने पद कह दें लेकिन फारसी गुलबदन बन बानो बेगम पढ़ी लिखी इसलिए कहलाती थी कि उन्होंने फारसी में अपना अकाउंट लिखा था तो वही दौर आज का है कम से कम हिंदुस्तान में जहां हम अंग्रेजी में बात करते हैं लेकिन आई प्रॉमिस 
that very soon uh, we would also be uh, making certain presentations uh, which are uh, in Hindustani or uh, uh, Hindi, whatever you call it. And uh, uh, there are a certain, uh, you know, uh, uh, for example, uh, Pursoto Magarwal is going uh, to speak uh, to us and I, I would request him to agrezi na karke wo hindi mein bol de jo mujhse comment kiya gaya ye dukh zahir kiya gaya ke bahut se log kyunki ye kaha gaya ke jo aapka maqsad hai your uh, you know my my aim or our aim the aim of asha in ganga jamni is that uh, uh, myths should be done away with and a proper history based on sources should reach the public. It should not remain confined only to the intel intellectual sec uh, you know, sections of the society. Uh, uh, so for that, it is very necessary that uh, we should also include uh, certain lectures which are given uh, in a language which is understood by the Hindi speaking areas, uh, uh, UP, Madhya Pradesh, uh, uh, Bihar, uh, you know, when we were starting with these series, we did, uh, it, uh, you know, uh, think about this, what to do. Should we have it uh, in non-English uh, Hindustani language or should we continue with English? Then, uh, you know, in, uh, if you remember all those who have attended our uh, initial lectures, they would be remembering that we were bilingual. For example, when there was a Pakistani scholar, so we have done a lot of Hindustani and a lot of Angrezi. But then uh, what we realized is that uh, you know, the people who are listening in, they are not confined only, only to the Hindi belt. Uh, India uh, is much more larger. And secondly, our lectures are not only being heard in India, but outside as well. And that is why we thought that at the moment we would continue in English. Uh, let me once again thank uh, 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 my, uh, you know, uh, guest and a friend indeed, Dr. Francesca Orsini. As I pointed out uh, at the beginning when uh, we started with this lecture and when, when I was int introducing her, I told uh, that uh, I interacted uh, with her at a time when I was at SWAS. Uh, uh, Francesca, when I had gone to Swiss, I had gone soon after a heart attack. Uh, mm -hmm. So I was not lit, uh, very, very mobile during that period of time. Uh, I was very laid back and I couldn't benefit as much as I should have done during my stay there. But thanks to your weekly seminars, mm -hmm. I learned a lot. You know, uh, folks, uh, Francesca, her hafte, a program, a seminar, karti thi, or just may but a hoopsurat lectures who are cut the or own lectures get through, uh, you know, that was one of the things which I used to look forward, uh, every week. K Kab Hoga or Francesca Kabere pass email Iga, K Fanakari Fanakamre, uh, who lecture who neja. I have the boss, eh, Imre Bang or colleague Imre Banga, Abhi, uh, her half day. Hindi COVID naam se. Achha, achha. Jo pan hai. <laughs> Ek uh, um, ha, webinar kar, uh, karte hai, jisme alag alag log part, mani purani Hindi ka part karte hai. Aur aap, uh, usme achhi, mani khubhi ye hai ki log Amerika se join kar rahe hai, jood rahe hai, Hindustan se aur अगर आप ब्रज भाषा पढ़ना चाहें तो आप उनको जरूर ईमेल करें इमरे बांग मैं, मैंने मैंने उनको कांटेक्ट किया है एंड ही इज रेडी टू बी अ पार्ट ऑफ दिस सो वी विल बी इनवाइटिंग हिम एज़ वेल सो वंस अगेन थैंक्स अ लॉट आई ओ यू अ लॉट वंस अगेन फॉर एग्रीइंग टू कम एंड बी हियर इन स्पाइट ऑफ द फैक्ट दैट यू आर सो बिजी थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर द डिस्कशन बाय बाय Bye-bye. Uh, so, uh, well, I think that uh, uh, we will be continuing with these. And uh, uh, Shagufta, please go ahead and inform uh, the viewers about the next week. Uh, 
Uh, so for uh, Friday at 7, we have Dr. Supriya Gandhi, who will be taking up a source from medieval history. Um, Dara Shukur's uh, Majma Ul Bahrain. And then on Sunday 13th at 7, we have Agra, as it was um, Garden of Princess Jahaara by Eba Koch. And um, you guys you all are very good scholars. Be there. Yes, see you all at seven and um, have a great uh, Sunday night and whatever remains of it. And see you all next weekend. Good night. Bye -bye. Good night.